Hello, and welcome to the next episode in my Blender tutorial series. In this episode, we're going to be going into the many different tools and concepts that are used in edit mode. There's a lot of them, but if you understand the underlying concepts that go into using those tools, you'll be better able to, when you're trying to make something, know when to do it by hand, and when to go looking for a tool, because Blender may already have you covered. Hopefully, this will help with the problem of not knowing what you don't know, which for me at least, is a pretty big barrier to entry whenever it comes to learning something like this. I would highly recommend watching the previous video in this series before you watch this one, unless you already know all the concepts involved. As a recap of last video, we learned about edit mode. We get there by pressing tab, we learned that this edits the underlying shape of the mesh, and we learned that meshes are made out of verts, edges, and faces. And you can edit those in the three modes up here by pressing 1, 2, and 3. We learned that the basic editing key bindings work here, so if we select a face, we can press G to move it, R to rotate it, or S to scale it and get some pretty weird results. And we can also lock axes as we did before by pressing X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. We learned that the mesh data gets fed into the object properties, and that gets fed into the top of the modifier stack, and whatever comes out of the bottom is what shows up on our screen. We learned about the outliner pane and how we can use the view layer in order to organize our file with collections. So that's the recap. If you want to support this kind of content, I do have a Patreon linked in the description. Every little bit helps. Anyway, in this video, we're going to be building on those concepts and learn about the modal editing, which is a very powerful approach to getting you into flow as you make stuff. To motivate this, we're going to be modeling this seal. As before, we're using an icon from Planet Falls Brass Tax Mod as concept art to redesign the icon in a style that's more consistent with Factorio's rendered designs. Let's get into it. To start, let's set up a collection for this. So twirl everything in, select this, make a new collection, call it seal, give it a sub collection, call it seal lighting, and let's turn these off for now. I'm also going to rename this parent collection here, brass tax icons. And with that, we can now select this collection here. So everything we make will go into this one. Now we're going to create a new mesh and what's interesting is I have two choices here that can both get me to where I need to go. The circle and the cylinder. This is one interesting point about Blender. There's no one right way to make something. Usually it's less a matter of which one's better or worse, but rather which one's more or less efficient. That being said, when you're new to Blender, I wouldn't spend too much time thinking about this. You can get into analysis paralysis or ironically, end up spending more time thinking about how to do it faster than you save when you actually go to do it. It's worth it to consider, but don't spend too much time on it early. The reason is what I mentioned earlier. You don't know what you don't know yet. That's going to come with experience. So my suggestion is to just dive in. To that end, I'm gonna pick cylinder. And as you can see, we have a cylinder, but what I really wanna draw your attention to is this little thing down here. This is called the modal editing window. This only comes up when you create a mesh or use a tool, something like that. What it does is it gives you a great deal of options and control over what actually gets created in the scene. Go to solid mode so we can see what we're doing. I'm going to change some of these things. For example, I can change the number of vertices by clicking and dragging. And you can see I get all sorts of shapes. For right now, we're going to stick with 32. You can also change the radius, the depth, and a bunch of other stuff I would encourage you to explore. Some can save you a whole lot of time by doing some of the modeling at the generation stage. There are a few quirks though. It's fairly fragile. If you use another tool or even click off of it, it'll go away. Blender does give you a chance to get it back though. If you press F9 before you do anything else, then you get the window back and you can go back to editing. However, if you do something else like move it, press G and X, now pressing F9 brings up the last thing I did, which is a move operation, not the creation operation. Side note, even the move operation has a modal menu. But what that means is that I can't go back to the stage where I create this. Even if I undo, it'll go away, but redoing it doesn't bring back the modal menu and F9 can't get it either. I don't know why, I have a feeling it has something to do with the internal workings of Blender, but it's something to keep in mind. One last detail, it can also be called the context or parameter menu. So if you're looking it up, try those too if you can't find it. All right, but let's model this now. I'll select this. Press S to scale, Z for Z axis, and I'll bring it in. I'll then scale it again, press S, and press Shift Z, bring it out in the XY plane. And now I have something that's roughly the shape of what I'm looking for, but not quite. That means we need to go into edit mode. It's usually a best practice to apply the scale before you go into edit mode. So to do that, we'll press Control A, 
click scale, and now it's one. Let's go into edit mode. What we want to do is to punch a hole in this. And while there are several ways of doing it, we're going to learn how to do so with the inset tool. It's easier to just show what it does rather than try to explain it. Let me go into face mode, select a face, and pressing I will go into inset mode. As you can see, it's insetting the face here. This will work on any face technically. I can press I again, and it'll go in again, press I again. It'll even work on this face here. It can work on groups of faces. So if I select a few of these by holding shift and clicking, I can press I, and it'll bring them in there. If I press I a second time, it'll go in individual faces. As you can see, this is a very powerful tool. For right now, we can keep it simple. Let me undo my way back. What I would like to do is to punch a hole in this. In order to do that, I'm going to need to inset a face on both sides. So what I can do is I can move the camera around underneath, hold shift and select, and now I have both faces selected. I can press I and scale it in, and I get the exact same thing on both sides. This is actually a little too much. Let me scale it back out, S, shift Z. Now to punch a hole in this, I'll delete the faces. To do that, I'll press X, click faces, and boom, they're gone. Now, as you can see, there's a problem. We need to fill these faces in here. Now, there are several ways we could go about this. The easiest by far is to select this bottom ring and top ring and do what's called bridge edge loops. To do that, I'll press two to go into edge mode. I'll hold alt and I'll click on this side here. Alt click will try to select an edge loop. And in this case, it's essentially this ring here. Now I wanna select this edge loop too. I'll press and hold alt, but I'm also going to press and hold shift so it adds to the selection. Now I'll click on this and I get both edge loops. Let me zoom out so you can see it. Let me go into wireframe mode. In order to do that, I simply press Z. This is a little trick that I use often. I'll go into wireframe mode just because the contrast between not highlighted and highlighted is very distinct. And as you can see, I have just the two edge loops selected. Anyways, let's go back to solid mode. And with these two things selected, I'll bridge the edge loops. To do that, I'll right click and simply go to bridge edge loops. And that filled it all in. Great. So this is the base ring. The next thing we want to do is to make that raised rubber edge. There are a couple of different ways we can go about this. To do this, we would like to create a ridge here, which means we need to create some more geometry. One quick way of doing this is by using create edge loops. Just like before, it'll be easiest if I just show you what it does. To do so, press Control R and bring the mouse pointer to the edge you want to wrap the loop around. So if I point at this edge here, it'll wrap the loop perpendicular to it. If I bring it to this edge, it'll go around that one so on and so forth. What we would like to do is to put more than just one here though. I'm going to roll the mouse wheel up and you'll see I get two. You can do this as much as you like, but really we only need two. Once we've gotten the number that we need, we click and now we can move them around. I'm going to press escape because I wanna leave them essentially centered, which is its default location. Now you can see we get our modal menu. This gives us our last chance to edit this if we want to. I can forget the number of cuts if I need to. There are other options. It's definitely worth looking over. However, I want to talk about the use of the mouse wheel to control the number of cuts. How would you know to do that if I hadn't said it? It's not said anywhere in the program. I'm going to show you a couple of places to find that information to help you when you go to learn on your own. We'll start with Blender's manual. I'm going to go over to the search, type in loop cut, click on the first thing, and boom, here's some information about it. And it's worth a quick read through. However, this still doesn't answer the question I posed earlier. This page won't tell you that rolling the mouse wheel will influence the number of cuts the tool will make. To find that out, we have to go one link deeper. Loop, cut, and slide. And if you look down here, there it is. There's no way to know which link to click on to get you the information you want, so it's a good idea to be a bit inquisitive and explore a little. If you're anything like me, you end up with that effect where you go to Wikipedia and half an hour later, you're on a completely different topic and you have no idea how you got there. The lesson here is that when you learn a new tool, it probably would do you some good to spend about two minutes looking through the manual and you probably should click through a bit. One thing I wanna point out is that when you press Control R, what it's doing is it's giving you the modal tool version of the loop cut and slide operator. You'll often find that sort of ethos here in Blender. If you're wondering where the loop cut and slide operator itself is, it's right here. When you click on the button and use the tool, it behaves slightly differently. And I'll admit, it's not something I personally do, so I'm not gonna speak too much about it. But feel free to experiment, because what works for you may not be the same thing that works for me. Okay, so that's one place to find the special modal key bindings that show up when you start using a tool. There's two other places to look that are inside the program itself. Let me select this face, and I'll press I to go into inset mode. And if you look at the top left of the screen, you can see some information about what the tool is doing. It updates live as I move the mouse. 
What's important is that you can also see some of the key bindings that just opened up. For example, if I press O, this becomes an outset, not an inset. Very handy. The other place to look is in the bottom of the screen. If I press E for extrude, you'll notice I just got a whole bunch of new key bindings. These can be a little difficult to read, so again, I might refer you to the manual, but it can be a good reference. My favorite, though, isn't actually found inside of Blender. This next example comes from an add-on called HardOps. I have no relationship with them, I just like their stuff. I'm only bringing it up because it has my favorite way of communicating to the user the new key bindings that come up with a particular mode. If I press Q and go to Bevel, you can see I've got the information along the bottom of the screen here, which is really good, but I also could press H in the lower right, and now I get this huge menu here. This tells me everything this tool does. Hands down, this is my favorite. It's unobtrusive when I don't need it, and it's there when I do. It's also very easy to see. So that's three, possibly four ways of finding more information about these tools as you use them. I would highly suggest you do it because you'll be surprised just how much functionality has been added to these tools. That is one of the beauties of having modal interactions. One tool can serve many different purposes. That just hinted at our next tool, E to extrude. What we would like to do is to take this middle ring here and raise it up. To accomplish this, I'm going to use the same thing we did for the edge loop, except we're going to select a face loop. If I'm nearest this edge, I'm going to press Alt and left click. It'll direct the loop that way. One quick thing that can hang someone up, what happens if I do the same thing over here? When I use the key binding, I was nearest to this edge, so it directed the loop that way. In Blender, where the cursor is strongly influences what that tool will do. In this case, just like with the loop cut tool, the thing that matters is which edge is the cursor nearest. Okay, so to extrude, we simply press E, and it's going to go up. Probably that's fine right there. And that gives us, roughly, the shape we're going to need. Now, there are a few details. Let me head to object mode. I don't like the super sharp edges here. Let's start by simply adding the bevel modifier. Add modifier, bevel. And it looks like hot garbage. Let's lower this down. And that's much better. However, I don't like that there's a soft edge between these two things here. If you look at our reference picture, this is supposed to be a very sharp edge because this is rubber on top and this is brass on the bottom. In order to accomplish this, we're simply going to make a vertex group, which is just a collection of verts, and we're going to tell this bevel operator to only operate on those. So, because we're going to be dealing with vertex data, we're going to go to the data properties tab here. And you can see the first thing here is vertex groups. All this is, is basically groupings of vertices. Let's make a new one. We'll just press plus. It just creates a blank one here, and we can see that if we go into edit mode. Let me press tab, hit one to go to vertex mode, and what I can do is I can click on select. Doing this says, take every single vert that's in this group and add it to your selection. As you can see though, nothing got selected. What we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we do select this. So we're going to say, let's add to this group all of the verts that we want to have beveled. What's interesting is that I'm going to use the same alt click in order to select a ring of verts here. And I'm going to do so by simply pointing at the edge, holding alt and clicking with the left click. Even in vert mode, that'll still give me all those. Then I'll add to that selection by holding Shift and Alt. And if I press Z, you can see that I have the two inside rings here unselected. Now I'm going to assign them to this group. And if I deselect everything, now clicking Select will actually bring back what I had before. That's because these verts are in that group. Now these vertex groups get used for all sorts of different things. In this case, we want to use it to drive the bevel. So I'll click on Modifiers, go to Bevel, and instead of saying limit method angle, I'm going to click on vertex group. Now it doesn't know what to do because I don't have any vertex groups selected. So I'm simply going to click on this and I'm gonna click on the group we had from earlier. Let me hit Z. And what you'll notice if I go to object mode is that this is now a sharp edge and everything else is nice and rounded. You also may notice that these little faces are a bit more noticeable now. The reason is that Blender is going to try to smooth the transition between two adjacent faces whenever you click Shade Smooth. If you put in a bunch of extra faces, like from Bevel, it's going to smooth out from this big face to this little one, and you'll get this here. The reason this is happening is because of the limit method. The reason the limit method is here is because you typically don't want the bevel to apply to every single face in the entire object. As such, what this does is it allows you to say, hey, only do it to things that meet this criteria. You can limit it based on angle, or you can limit it based on vertices. Either way, moving forward, you can choose whatever works best for you. Okay, so let's set this up for rendering. This will look very much like the last two videos. I'll press keypad zero to occupy the camera. I'm going to take this and I'm going to tip it a little. So I'll say R, 
Y. Then I'll say R, Z. That'll give it this nice sort of profile here. I'll go into rendered mode. I'll select the lighting collection. I'll add in some planes for some lighting like usual. Let me give these a new material. There we go. Give this an emission property, set it to one. We're gonna rotate this in the X axis by 90 degrees. Move this out on the Y axis. Move this out over here. Rotate it a bit, make it larger. Set this to indirect only so we only see part of it. I'm going to duplicate it and move it on the XY plane out here. I'm going to rotate it again, bring it down. About right there is good. Bring it in. I'm trying to get some nice rim lighting here. So that'll be good enough for right now. We'll play with the materials and we'll adjust that in a little bit. Here's another little trick. If I click here, you'll notice it selects the light object instead of the workpiece. To help with that, I'll come over to the outliner. I'll bring this down again. And now I'm going to select this. This will expose a toggle for all of the items that will make them either selectable or not selectable. So we'll expose the toggle and I can uncheck it for the collection. And so when I go to select the ring, I can do it just fine. Let me also come in here and give this a name. Seal, I'll call this seal key light, and I'll call this seal rim light. There we go. And now we can give this a material. To start, I'll simply click on the material list and I'll pick brass. But this isn't quite what we want. We'd like this ridge to be a different material. So what I can do is I can add another slot. And what's interesting about Blender is that you can apply different materials to different faces. To do so, I'll go into edit mode, this is a little hard to work with, so I'll head back to solid. And I'm going to turn this off in the viewports so that now I can see this directly. I'm going to head to face mode by pressing three. And I'm going to click off so I have nothing selected. Now I'll select this ring by holding alt and left clicking at this edge here. I want this side of the ring here and I want this side here. And while I could hold shift alt and try to click, it turns out there's an easier way. If I press control plus, it will expand the selection one unit. If that unit's a face or a vertex or an edge will depend on what mode you're in. Now that I have these selected, I can apply this slot here by saying assign. Now that it's been assigned, we need to make sure that it has a material. I'm going to say new, and we're going to make this from scratch. We're going to call this rubber. I'll protect it. Now if I go back to rendered mode and I turn the lighting back on, I'm gonna head to object mode. You can see I have a different material applied here. Now we just have to make it look like rubber. Well, this isn't too hard. What I'll do is I'll take the base color and I'll drop it down to black and I can give this a matte finish, which will make it dull instead of shiny. To do so, I'll increase the roughness and this looks a little dark to my eye. So maybe I'll bring this up and I think everything else we'll need to do is just me screwing around with the light. So give me one second. Okay, I'm largely happy with this. Let me just do a quick renaming here. Notice how I gave each object an individual texture. What that allows me to do is to increase or decrease the intensity as I need on a per light basis. If they all shared a material, changing one would change the others. I'll just protect these. And there we go. Now if we hit render, we get a seal. I'm not quite happy with this. I might bring up the lighting a little bit. I might darken the rubber a little more. I might not make it so rough. I may bring this down some, give it a little bit of, bit of metallic here, give it some definition. There we go. There, I'm pretty happy with that. Tuning the way the lighting is set up will change how this looks. For right now, I'll call this good enough. And there you have it, now we have a seal. In this episode, we learned more about edit mode. We learned about the extrude and inset tools, two of the most commonly used tools in my kit. We learned where to look to find the modal key bindings for the tools we're using. We learned how to apply multiple materials to a single object. We learned about vertex groups and how they can be used to inform the behavior of modifiers for a particular mesh. You may be surprised, but at this point you actually know a great deal. I'm going to continue releasing episodes for this series, but if there's something in particular that interests you, or if there's some task that you need to do for your project, I would highly recommend looking around the internet and seeing if there are some tutorials to help you with it. If nothing else, feel free to stop by my Discord, and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Either way, thank you so much for watching, take care of yourselves, be good to each other, and I will see you in the next one.